Welcome to this week's episode of Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of a healthy world. And today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Ilan Samish, CEO and co-founder of Am I Proteins, an innovative food tech startup based out of um, Israel, designing some very novel um, and interesting um, uh, protein um, proteins. Um, and I, I've known Ilan for a number of years. It's great to have you on the show, Ilan. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Simon. Um, now, tell me, Ilan, well, where you've got a, um, well, where, I'm, I'm thinking about your early upbringing, some of the key forces, right, that really help shape and influence where you are now. So uh, if you want to go really early, you need to go to the age of um, really very young childhood. I was, I am a twin and uh, my sister always um, ate le less than me and somehow the calories affected her more than they did affect me. And consequently, I was not allowed to eat ice cream. I couldn't tell her if I went to the doctor and had ice cream, I couldn't tell her. And I got obsessed with uh, sugar and with um, what causes obesity uh, because it's not fair the two, two twins eat the same and it affects their metabolism quite different. So that's as early as it gets. How um, old are we talking about? Uh, I don't know, age of three, four, five. Uh, right. When I was, uh, as a young kid, you, you go to the doctor, they tell you, then you can have ice cream, but you cannot tell your sister, so she won't be jealous. Um, so I really, um, and later on also, uh, sugar for me is a big issue. Um, they say uh, obesity is in your head and not in your belly. And while my belly does not look obese, my head is, uh, does have all the issues of guilt. You want to enjoy and have the, um, the joy of uh, sugar, which activates your uh, nucleus accumbens in the brain, just like heroin. Uh, but then um, you feel the guilt. So, so I was always obsessed with this guilt and joy issue. Um, later on, I, I had issues in school. And in one school, actually, they told my parents that they will kick me out because I stopped going there. And my mom said all his uh, report card is all straight A's. And then I went to a um, what's called an open school, uh, which was a lot of fun. And I, uh, some people like really to, to dive deep into one topic. I was always curious about many different topics. And um, luckily, after my um, military, which um, is part of the startup nation here, I, I must say I'm proud of my uh, citation from the director of military intelligence much more than any of the other um, many awards that I got later on. But some later, I was very fortunate to join a very unique uh, program in the Tel Aviv University, which is called the Interdisciplinary Program for Fostering Excellence, where they take 15 candidates out of the 10,000 that go there every year, and they tell them, study whatever you want, no prerequisites, as long as you cannot study it by a regular curricula. And every semester, you can redesign what you study I studied, for example, quantum chemistry quite in the beginning, and usually you have to do before that four or five courses in math, and I never did a course in math. It seemed to be a waste of time. And I ended up, um, and also during the summers, I, I did some uh, lab work, which ended up being bigger than my master's that I did later on. It's a Weizmann, and I, I ended up doing something which is called structural um, protein biophysics, computational structural biology, or, or um, computational biophysics, um, which was a pretty new field. And then at the Weizmann Institute, I met Professor Avigdor Scherz, who, who I was really fascinated by him. He had a big dilemma whether to be a painter or to be a scientist. He ended up being a scientist, but very creative. And after his wife had uh, breast cancer, he uh, developed a new drug for cancer, um, which I hope one day um, we will enjoy because old people do have cancer. Only question is, is it malignant or not? But I saw there the process of taking an idea and moving it to the academia. And with that in mind, 
I, I thought I'll go to the Weizmann, I'll study something important in any uh, department, but not in plant sciences because I'm very happy with curved bananas. I don't need to straighten them up. And I ended up doing my PhD on photosynthesis as a model for membrane proteins, proteins which communicate between the cell and the outside, which are most drug targets. And I looked specifically on how it can work in Antarctica and in scalding hot springs and designed it to work in a much higher temperature. And I got fascinated with design. So I went to the guy who in, invented the field of protein design, Professor Bill DeGrado. He was then in UPenn, now he's in UCSF. And I worked on computational protein design. I found out that so many people are talking about it and, and mm -hmm. how the strings of letters called amino acids turn into this structure which conveys function but very few people have been successful in it. So I decided to look into it and what came out of it is, is the most popular uh, book in the field of computational protein design. That's the name of the book. And in parallel, trying to talk with others, what in my PhD, I, I uh, founded and co-chaired what became the main meeting in computational structural biology. But after I put out the book and I was already back to Israel in an academic career after 18 years in academia, mm. it was the first time in my life I couldn't sleep. And I couldn't Why? sleep because I thought so many people are talking about design. So few people know how to do computational protein design. I think I can do it. And I think I can do it in a way that will be much more influential than writing another academic paper which I, is very important and I had the fun of doing for many years. And I quit my academic career. My parents thought I'm totally nuts. They told me you have a, such a nice career <laughs> becoming a professor in academia. And I sat at home a few uh, months. I told my PhD advisor I'm getting nuts at home. So I, I got actually a seat in his lab just so I have people around me. And I looked on what proteins can enjoy design. I had the dilemma whether to go to proteins in, in pharma for uh, drugs, uh, the most selling uh, drugs are proteins, or to go to food. And I thought that sweet proteins are an amazing target for computational protein design because you have along the equatorial belt, you have half a dozen hyper sweet protein, 700 to 2000 times sweeter than sugar. However, they are not in the market. They are not in the market because they have a very low stability. For example, monelin in 45 degrees Celsius denatures just like boiling an egg and loses functionality. Mm. It's extremely expensive to extract them from the shrubs in the jungles where they are used to seduce animals to eat their fruit and spread their seeds in the jungle. Mm. They also have a lingering taste. I thought if I can mm. redesign this protein and mimic life in hell, because it lives in the, in the equatorial belt in, in, in heaven, but the mass food market is a hell of an environment. Now, if we can mimic life in hell, and you do have life in the Dead Sea and hot springs deep in the mm. ocean, acidic swamps, then we can design a extremophile, a protein which is very well fit for high temperature, high salt, high acid, and it can be produced very uh, cost efficiently and sustainably using microorganisms such as yeast. Mm. With that idea, I came to um, the Strauss Group, which had then the, won the franchise of the Israeli government, the Israel Innovation Authority for a technological incubator. And I told them I want to do this. They told me, you only have a CV. How can you do it? I mean, you need a proof of concept. They said, fine, I can do it within the Weizmann Institute, but then I won't get back to you. But happily, they spoke with their advisors, PepsiCo, Denon, which are their business partners, and they um, did accept me. And I wanted to be product focused, so I did want an industrial incubator and not coming from the academia. 
Yeah. And that was in 2016, and the rest is history. Amazing, amazing. Oh, that, that's a, that is a, a, great, uh, a great journey. And do you know what? For you, though, that journey, I, I get what you're saying about that sleepless night and you wanted to bring something to market, but the transition, because you were so steeped in, in your academia. And, um, you know, the first thing I can think about is making the jump to, okay, you want to bring something to market, but now all of a sudden you're CEO and a founder of a company um, from academia. So that's some journey uh, in itself. And I, I, I'm curious, I mean, you know, what, what for you, when you outline the journey of a CEO for you, what, do, what does, you know, how, how do you reflect on that? Or what are the things that stand out for you in, ter in terms of, you know, maybe the challenges and the learning specifically? Yeah, so it's a very good point. So in academia, you're embedded with a notion that this is an ivory tower and everything else is less good. And I spoke with a few leaders in industry, and I actually thought that this is not always the case. And for me, leadership is leadership wherever it is. And I had my training in the military where I did some, earned a lot of leadership experience. And then in the, my PhD where I ran a, a conference I built and, and quite a few other educational activities. And I found out that in industry, there is a lot of leadership. There is a lot of people who really want to do things which are interesting. Finding the right people is the most important thing. So in academia, you have some people who do things only by themselves. I was always prefer to work with a team, whether I'm leading the team or part of the team. Um, but a lot of things I must say in Tel Aviv, you have uh, a lot of uh, uh, towers of like 50 and more floors, which I never have been at before joining the industry. And now all of the, um, all of the lawyers and, and the CPAs and the consultants and so on, I got to know much more of that. I got to know much more of planning, much more minded of resources and resource allocation. And um, I think in, in academia, time is much less of an issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, you do have grants and you have a PhD and within four and a half years, you need to finish something, but it's much less of a Gantt charge where you say you will do something and you have to do it. And if you don't do it, you lose your credibility and you can only lose your credibility so much and then you're out of the game. Mm. So it's not like people are working more hard, less hard. It's a different type of focus. And while in academia, you need to publish papers and then you get grants and you need your peers to, to like you because then you get the degrees and the papers and the students. Here it's more with investors. And actually with that, um, while I was in academia, I was quite uh, not happy to see that a lot of the world outside is less keen of science and moving to all kinds of non-scientific fake news things. And I became pretty active just as a hobby as a popular science journalist. Mm. And with that in mind, I thought that a lot of my good training to become a CEO was being a popular science journalist. Because then when I wrote something and I was very happy about it, I went to the editor and the editor chopped it and changed it completely because I spoke in the language too much of science and not enough of the popular people. And the same comes here. At the end of the day, it's a lot of explaining to the important people. And the important people are not the PhDs. The important people are the consumers the investors, the um, people who are with the money. Um, and, but, and overall, I'm really happy that I made the move and I must say I enjoy myself and, and feel a lot more meaning than I had in most of my career in academia. Oh, that's great, that, that's great. And I'm sure the journalism and your passion for lecturing on the subject would have been so helpful in that communication piece, you know, really, really clear about that. I'm also figuring that when you come from the lab, you know, where you've spent a lot of your life and uh, 
you know, it must be a challenge to delegate stuff. You know, you can't be the CEO, the CTO, and everything involved with the science, can you? You know, so that must be a tough journey, right? To to trust people that they're going to do stuff as you would do it, right? Yes, uh, definitely. It's not always easy. Um, I really try hard to recruit people who are better than me. And I also have something that once in a while I ask people, why do you think I'm an idiot? And in most cases, they're right. And getting the real opinion of people is important, but delegating and to whom you delegate and the, the very fact that that the day is limited. I mean, I, you know, I, I get up an hour earlier every day, so I only have 25 hours a day. It's not yeah. enough. <laughs> so at the end of the day, uh, without delegating and without doing um, building a team, and I think that the most important and challenging thing in a startup is to build a team. And in this sense, um, before we were even 10 people, I got a, a um, VP of people and impact. Um, because in a deep tech startup, one of the things that people keep forgetting, including the CEO, I'm not putting myself out of it, is that you can be excellent in science and technology, but at the end of the day, if not everyone is working together, and if you bring a, a um, team of stars, you put stars together, you have all kinds of bizarre forces that come into play, and how to build a team, how to also take the um, medium level managers and move them into becoming managers out of you no, know, you need the shadowing, you need the um, the experience and both in the board level, um, I try to get such experience. So um, board chair uh, Rick Grobel managed thousands of people in the um, B2B field in, in uh, DSM as, as president of human nutrition and health, president of Monsanto Brazil, um, and business development leading in, in Python and, and others. Um, and that's very important. So, so I think the, um, the brainstorming and expanding your brain by bringing people who know much more than you on topics which are critical are important. And then after Rick joined, on one hand, I had the, the focus of the industry was an industrial incubator that is led by a consumer packaged good company with two international companies behind them, the non PepsiCo and the Schwarz Group. And then um, Rick joined as a world expert in B2B, also did some sales, led sales, annual sales of, of billions in, in consumer um, B2C. Um, but then I felt like I don't have enough know-how in um, financial aspects of uh, startups. And happily, I met Dr. Amir Gutman, who um, has a PhD in finance from Berkeley and many years as a professor teaching financial entrepreneurship from the financial side and, and the A courses. And I, I got him on board and together, I think um, we, we complement each other with, uh, with a know-how in different fields. So, um, so yes, in academia, some people, I mean, um, Albert Einstein did a um, E equals uh, um, MC and, and all of the equations square, of course, and, um, and he did it alone. He did it in an office closed, but I was never like that. Yes, I did a lot of work by myself, even publishing a book and papers, you do a lot of things by yourself, uh, but they really always liked more of the teamwork. So for me, it was natural, but building a team is definitely the biggest, biggest and most important issue. Mm, absolutely. That's great. So um, the thing about Am I Proteins, I mean, you're, you're, you know, you set the company up to solve a problem and, you know, you were really confronted with an issue and a challenge that you wanted to, you know, you wanted to create a difference out there as it were so just tell us a little bit about uh, you know about the vision and about what your dream is for the company so um my dream has two different levels the first one is sugar reduction and the second one is design of proteins mm. and when you build a company you have to realize in 
when you have very little money, and I began just with $650,000, which is nothing, let alone when you're multidisciplinary and have a department of computational protein design, biotechnology, and food technology. So it's very hard to do, and you need to do a lot of outsourcing and a lot of things which are very initial proof of concept. But from day one, I had the vision of building a platform. And the platform is making designer proteins which are fit to the mass food market as to cost, taste, health. Um, and we have targets, specific targets for the meat, plant, and milk industries. And the idea is to make a protein which is super stable, hypoallergenic, super tasty, and cost effective. Mm. But the first target, which is the biggest non communicable disease health threat, the biggest um, threat in our diet is sugar overconsumption. Mm. I opened Amai in 2016, end of 2016, and it was only in 2017 where Lancet published a pure study looking on 350,000 people for seven years and finding that sugar underlies a metabolic syndrome. We know the manifestations of that, obesity, diabetes, uh, cancers, especially epithelial cancers, some mental diseases, not to mention tooth decay and many other things, but sugar is really the worst thing that we put in our mouth. And with that in mind, um, cutting down on sugar and also seeing it firsthand from my sister and, and others was for me really a life mission. Mm. Now, all of the sugar alternatives are small molecules. Small molecules continue to activate the sweet receptor along our digestive tract, alter the microbiome. There was just a big paper showing that cause a delayed glycemic response and, and generally are not good for you. Maybe they're less bad than sugar, but still yeah. they're not good for you. So with that in mind, I thought proteins can do the job because a protein is a huge molecule and we have a whole system of digesting proteins to get their amino acids. So while they activate the sweet receptor just like any other sweetener, in the upper gastrointestinal tract, they are digested to their constituents, to the amino acids, and consequently no adverse effect with a microbiome, liver, and kidneys, unlike all other sweeteners. So with that in mind, I opened Amai, I analyzed all the different proteins, and with our team, we redesigned it with what we now call the ProCube platform, beginning with a ProDesign AI CPD, computational protein design, where we mimic design of proteins which are in harsh conditions. Then once we have a new sequence of amino acids, we produce it in microorganisms and with our pro-planet microbial precision fermentation department, we produce it in large scale in um, a very sustainable and cost efficient way. And then the main issue, which for me was one of the more interesting journeys was a food technology department. Sam Marco, who was a CTO of uh, Materna that introduced to the world infant, um, um, infant uh, um, baby formula um, and is now a subsidiary of Nestle. And then he was a CTO of uh, SodaStream that is now part of PepsiCo and in the middle of Israel's biggest dairy. He um, met me in a very early stage when I thought I'm, I need people in the field of sweet science. So together with Professor Masha Nivei, founded the Sweet Science Forum where all scientists, academia, and industries um, of, of uh, science came there. And, and uh, Sam was then in SodaStream and told me, this is interesting, come to me, I want to taste it with my people. And uh, now he, he leads a food technology department with Inbar Zucker, who is uh, the head of sensory evaluation. And at the end of the day, unlike other technologies such as direct evolution, you mm -hmm. use computational protein design when you don't have a high throughput method to analyze things and to find which variant is best. Just like in COVID, you have many variants and one sticks out from the crowd. So we could test very few things because there is no way to, to check whether you're good except tasting it. 
So one of the things is that we built a super taster panel of 20 super tasters that come twice a week in order to taste what we do, whether it is immediately when it comes out of the fermenter or whether it is after we, uh, we harass it with high temperature, acid, light, whatever, or whether it is where we implement it, integrate it into different uh, um, products. And we have numerous products, soft drinks, iced tea, iced coffee, um, warm drinks, uh, marzipan ketchup. Uh, marzipan and ketchup, for example, we do 70% sugar reduction and you cannot feel that it's not full sugar. Ice cream, yogurts, peanut butter. Peanut butter was interesting because there, after we removed 50% of the sugar, it was too salty. So we removed 50% of the salt and then it was too fatty. So we removed 40% of the added fat. And now we have a product which is less sugar, less salt, less fat and tastes just the same. So the sensory panel was, was really interesting. And now with this platform and with 42 employees, um, we move forward on one hand to market launch this year, and on the other hand to other proteins, sweet and non-sweet. Fantastic. So you're making products with, um, it's not just the sweet thing, you're, you're also you know, looking at the whole kind of fat and um, the fat composition as well. So yes, um, at the end of the day, our business is to sell a white powder, which makes people happy, mm. um, which is a good <laughs> definition to, um, to our <laughs> willing. Willing is the hyper sweet protein, which we do. But for example, in ketchup, when you remove 70% of the added ketchup, you get a liquid ketchup because sugar is used also to, to make it more firm. Yeah. Um, and when you get a liquid ketchup, you obviously need to take care of the texture. So we have at the end of the day, two very different complementary products. One is a white powder, which makes people happy, which is called swilling. The second one is a service to get your product and to reformulate it with our ingredient and other ingredients, as you will tell us with your guardrails. And for example, with one product, we were asked to remove the aspartame and it's a no sugar product. And we replaced aspartame with our product. And another one, it was to replace sugar and augment it. it can be with stevia, with, with uh, aspartame, with uh, erythritol, with whatever other sweeteners or bulking agents or other texturizing things to give you the same product, which is much healthier, it's not more expensive, and it has much less sugar. Unlike sugar, all other sweeteners don't have a linear dose response, meaning that if you move from 1% to 2% or to 11 to 12%, you need to add in some level much more of the protein, much more of the sweetener, and then you begin to have some lingering taste or you simply cannot do it. So at the end of the day, we know in each product to reduce between 40 to 70% of the sugar without hampering the sensory profile. So yes, we focus on everything in the reformulation. We, we also need to be humble because if we work, for example, with Ocean Spray, which controls the cranberry um, market, cranberry juice, craisins or whatever, then they know the product much better. We can only offer them a prototype as we know a little bit about the protein. So we are very much geared towards doing joint development agreements and material transfer agreements. And we have quite a few of those from many, many of the world's biggest um, uh, companies that are working with us. Some have already with us five different agreements. And these are usually not very expensive agreements, but we don't do things without someone paying for it because then you trade it in a much more serious manner. And also we invest a lot in, in these in the reformulation and the product and the certificate of analysis of the product and of course in the sensory evaluation. Sounds great. It really does. It sounds uh it sounds amazing. You've you've come you've come a long way. And um you know I suppose like when, when you think about where you are on the journey. Right. Um, you know, when what does that look like for you? In fact, I suppose you talk about cost, we talk about scale. Um, what does that look like for you in terms of being able to get to market? 
That's a very good question. And some of it I know and some of it I don't. So I began with just doing a proof of concept. And after the initial proof of concept, getting feedback from the multinationals and my first choice was to Danon. And because I was in the Strauss incubator, the CTO of Danon opened the door and told me, how can I help you? And we learned a lot. We learned, for example, not to move into the pitfalls of stevia, for example, where they overused it and some people hate it because of the taste, despite the fact that if you only do 20, 25% sugar reduction with stevia, the taste is okay. And for issues like IP, and we are extremely aggressive on IP. So after the proof of concept, we went into R&D. And then the third phase was production R&D, which is a scale up in the techno-economics and techno-economics drives a lot of what we do, how to get the product in a good shape and a good price. And we promise not to be more expensive than sugar and sweetness units because we are so potent. A kilogram of our product swilling on average replaces 3.4 tons of sugar. Wow. Consequently, we can be cheaper than sugar. So after the production R&D, we are now at the stage of finalizing the regulatory um, experiments needed to get the regulatory clearance and moving to large scale production. So, so far we did 7,500 liters and the idea is to move next to 45,000 liters and then go to the hundreds of thousands of liters or hundreds of cubic meters, which is the same. And at the end of the day, you have fermenters, microbial precision um, fermenters, which are, sorry for that, which are up to the size of 1.2 um, um, million liters. And um, there is an economy of scale. There is also today an interesting topic where sugar is, has a wide range of cost according to territory. So in some places it costs $400, $500 a ton, in other places $1,000 a ton, it's a big difference. And at the end of the day for every cubic meter of our fermentation, we need over 300 kilograms of sugar. We make out of it a sweetener, which is much more potent. So we save a lot of sugar, but the yeast themselves, they do need to eat sugar. Mm. So we are now, so what happened is because the supply chain and the scale up are so important, Yigal um, Gesundheit, um, who also has a good family name for our company, <laughs> who, uh, came to Amai was just a belief that we are doing something good. And I told him at this stage, I have no money to give you. So in the beginning for quite a few months, he worked with no money till we got some money. He was the first non-scientist to come in. Um, and he came with, uh, after being a CEO for eight years and after doing business development in Teva, Rafa Labs, Vitamed. Um, so he began as a COO, but he then moved to become a chief production officer because on one hand, we have the front end business development with ingredient companies and consumer packaged good companies. And on the other hand, we have a very intricate and complex business development to do with the suppliers and the value chain in order to get the white powder to the end customer. Because mm -hmm. in many cases, it's not even swilling, 100% swilling, but you need to pre-blend it with other sweeteners or with the bulking agents. And for that, and to do that globally, you definitely need to um, focus on the supply chain and on the scale up. And um, at some point we said, this is a product going to the market. We are finishing the regulatory and then working on um, market launch and market launches in a tiered fashion. We are beginning with the United States, moving to Singapore, moving then hopefully to also to small Israel, which is a test bed, um, and to Latin America and to uh, Europe. Uh, Southeast Asia is 60% of the market, so it's a big market. And correspondingly, we have investors, and that was very important for me, to have investors from around the world, not only from Israel and the US. We have very good investors from Israel, iAngels, Weltech Ventures, and Zora Impact Fund, Health Avengers Wellness Fund, but we also have the Singaporean government. We have K3 Ventures from Singapore, which is of the Kwok family, the Sugar Prince of Southeast Asia, 
we have Sukden, which is the uh, biggest sugar trader in the world, mm -hmm. uh, Beiwa, which is in the ag uh, value chain in, in um, Germany, um, and um, Aston Partners from the US, Brad Bloom, uh, the, the founder of Berkshire Partners in, in Boston, and uh, Dragones from Argentina and Japan, Israel Venture Partners from uh, Japan and the Singaporean government. So it was very important from day one to really focus on building a platform and doing something which internationally will be um, valuable. Yeah, no, fantastic. And uh, with, with products, um... Oh, the UK might be an interesting market for you as well, you know, with the uh, the, you know, the the Brexit situation and the drive towards more scientific kind of breakthrough. That might be an interesting market. Definitely. The UK is a very interesting market. It's also a leader in science and in technology innovation. Um, what drives and we are definitely focused on moving both to move the UK and to Google. We did a lot of work on the regulatory path with EPSA, the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, the main criteria for us right now is how fast we can get to register clearance in each of the territories. Um, yeah. Um, we enjoyed uh, three different EIT food EU uh, funding programs which we did with, um, with uh, PepsiCo, with Danon, with VTT, with mass specs of Eastern Europe, with the University of Aarhus, University of Lund, and the Technion separate programs. Um, so definitely um, we are part of uh, the EU uh, funding program, and we definitely want to get to both uh, the UK and the EU. Yeah, no, great. It, it really seems that, you know, with, with Israel, the technology, and the opportunity to scale businesses. It, it's such a great infrastructure. It's amazing when you go to world events, how Israel really leads a, a lot of the innovation and science and technology in this space. Israel is definitely the startup nation. And um, I actually have on YouTube a, a rap I once wrote about it. I can give it to you in two and a half minutes at the end if you want. Um, and I think that in Israel, you have several factors which make it a startup nation. You have the military with a lot of leadership skills. You have the basic Jewish culture of debating. I mean, the, the Talmud, which is what the more um, ultra-Orthodox and, and Orthodox people learn, is not the Ten Commandments. You have to do A, B, C, but it's actually the argument between the leaders and how to do what and why you need to do that and not that. And when you highlight the discussion, you can call it discussion, you can call it argument, it builds a team and it builds the fact that it's okay and it's good to discuss and argue and not agree on everything mm. and do it with less of a hierarchy. I mean, in the military, you do have hierarchy and yet you learn from young age a lot of leadership. And then you are a diaspora nation where people came from abroad with a lot of willingness to, to succeed. And then failure is not considered something terrible. It's okay to fail. And with all of that together, we did become a startup nation. And I think compared to the population, Israel is definitely number one in the world in startups. Um, the attempt right now, which from the government to the startups like Amai, is to move from a startup nation to a scale-up nation. Mm. And already now, I mean, we, we have a chief marketing officer, Wouter Klerhout, who is in Belgium, who was many years in DSM leading marketing. And the next recruit will be from the United States. And also with um, um, large-scale production, we, we are focused on doing a lot in Israel, but also in other places. And I think moving from startup nation to scale-up nation you need to do a lot of collaborations, joint ventures, and really work with synergistic partners with win-win collaborations. Absolutely, yeah, different challenges. And uh, it's so complex, though, isn't it? The, the value chain, you know, the feedstock, the, you know, the organisms you are using, the scale up of it, and, uh, you know, it's uh, multi, uh, multifaceted. So, um, you know, really uh, exciting times for the business. Um, 
It definitely really exciting and definitely I think that microbial precision fermentation is going to change and revolutionize agriculture. It's simply we don't have enough land. Two thirds of the land that people use is for agriculture and we don't have enough and it cannot sustain much longer. I'm not mentioning, I mean, sugar is grown on land bigger than the UK. You need to transport 180 million tons of sugar causing a huge carbon footprint, not to mention herbicides, pesticides, and in uh, deforestation. And in the case of sugar, it also affects the lower socioeconomic class the most. So uh, we are definitely an impact company and, and happily we won the extreme tech challenge. Extreme tech challenge is 2000 startups in 20 regional competitions around the world. And then finals in 10 categories, we won first the ag and food category, and then we won the overall categories grand winner of 2022 and they focus on four criteria on um, market disruption and fit to market and team and an impact as transcended by the 17 UN sustainability development goals. But in a broader sense, I think the world needs and with COVID we saw it to be more self-sustainable also in local ways and when you produce a protein and yeast like we do you just need a brewery the only difference between us and a brewery is two things number one we need air we don't want the alcohol unfortunately to some of the people here so we put a lot of air into the fermenter and then we focus on getting the protein and the second thing and that's why it's called precision fermentation and not fermentation fermentation is one of the oldest technologies in the book. I mean, wine, beer, yogurt, kimchi, and all of these you eat or drink everything in the fermenter, we add a layer of harvesting. And we harvest and we filter out from the fermenter this um, protein, and then we spray dry it to get the white powder, which is called swilling. I think you'll see a lot more of that, not only in the business of sweeteners, but also in the business of milk, plant, and meat applications. Um, with meat, you for some things you need mammalian cells, which is much more expensive than microorganisms. But I think a lot of proteins you can simply produce by microorganisms in a cheap and in a sustainable way. For example, mm -hmm. in stevia, stevia today you can get from agriculture, or you can get it from fermentation, from precision fermentation. Now, stevia from agriculture, it's not reproducible; it's a mixture of rhabdozides with different concentrations, so each harvest is different. And when you do it from fermentation, you can get only Reb-M, which is a better tasting stevia, and you get it in less than half the price of stevia coming from agriculture. And this is just one small example. So definitely we are revolutionizing the ag space and we'll see more and more fermenters that in a local manner can produce a lot of good proteins and then you can use the yeast itself either for fertilizing the ground or you can give it to animals. We still have a little bit of the sweet protein in the yeast, so we can get, give it to feed to, to snacks of dogs or uh, horses or pigs who all love very sweet things and have issues because they love it so much. Mm, absolutely. I hadn't even considered that as a marketplace and, uh, um, you know, it's an opportunity. A big market. Mm. At the end of the day, we, we do need waste management. Part of moving from small scale to large scale, you need to think about waste management. You grow yeast, you have yeast at the end. You think about beer. You Most people drink filtered beer and not unfiltered beer. But then what do the breweries do with all of the yeast? Now, in some countries like Australia, people like to spread yeast on their bread, but in many places they don't. And then you need to either use it as a fertilizer for crops or to burn it, which is terrible, or to give it as feed to animals. And in our case, uh, it's called cake, by the way. You, you do a uh, continuous centrifuge, just like doing filtered beer. You remove the yeast out of the media. And in our case, the protein is, is excreted to the media. You still have some protein, some hyper-sweet protein, which is part of the cake, which is what comes out of the centrifuge, all the yeast. And that's very good for animals who love sweet things. And it's also the yeast is very good for you. So, All right. You know what? Next time I'm in Israel, in Tel Aviv, um, 
uh, I'm going to come and visit. I want to see. I want to see it operating. Maybe you know. Maybe I can design some of these proteins. Maybe you show me how to design some of these proteins in land. It can't be that difficult, can it? So we have a amazing <laughs> uh, computational protein design department <laughs> with uh, Dr. Professor actually Nama Koppelman, who is a professor of computational of uh, computer science, and we have a team of uh, three people um, and recruiting now more who each came from a different university, so very synergistic, um, doing um, computational biology. So it's actually, unfortunately, not many people in the world know how to do computational protein design. You do have two other companies in the field in, in the United States, both with um, excellent people whom I know for over 20 years. Uh, one Who are the two, Arzada and Codexis? Our Zeta and uh, Generate Biomedicine. Codexis has a component of design, but it's um, it's not the main thing, but Codexis also applies. Our Zeta is focused on enzymes, Generate Biomedicine by my uh, good friend, Gavo Gregorian. We postdoc together in uh, the same room, actually. Uh, for four and a half years, we had lunch together. So he uh, built Generate Biomedicine uh, doing uh, computational protein design for medical use. Yeah, no, great, great stuff. And Ilan, listen, you know, as you said, we could talk all day, right? And uh, I know you, I know you dedicated twenty hours for the chat, but uh, you know, I, I know you got a lot to be getting on with. So uh, just to say, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your journey. Thank you, Simon, and um, I also appreciate your work in um, in really top level executive uh, recruiting. And I'm sure that uh, we will need it as we are. Now we now we have one one leader outside Israel, and soon we'll have one in the United States, and then in all the different continents. So we do need very good people around the world, and it's not easy to find them.